Hello everybody and welcome back to the Sun of the Morning Comics channel and today is Fantastic Friday. I think this is the fifth Fantastic Friday that I've done here on the channel but uh, nevertheless today what we're what we're gonna be revisiting revisiting uh, is uh, Fantastic Four number 13. It's the April 1963 issue. Uh, also the first appearance of the Watcher who is one of my favorite characters out of the early FF issues this is definitely one of my favorites I absolutely love the Watcher so that's probably why <laughs> um, anyway uh, just a very cool story uh, where they're starting to have, I mean they'd already started branching out into space and stuff like that obviously that's where they got their powers from but this is just a really cool story that takes place on the moon. Very interesting stuff, very relevant to the time that it came out, very cool stuff. So obviously I'm not going to be using my copy even though it's not the uh, greatest copy in the world. Uh, I still don't want to use it. <laughs> not when we can use this guy here. All right, so got her open here, and uh, boy, I wish mine looked like that. <laughs> anyway, the issue for uh, issue 13 here is titled uh, The Fantastic Four versus The Red Ghost and His Indescribable Super Apes. Uh, so, you know, the story starts out here as uh, usual with uh, Reed Richards uh, almost blowing up uh, the Fantastic Four Tower, which has not been named the Baxter Building yet. But anyway, before we do that, obviously, story by J Stan Lee and art by Jack Kirby. This one with uh, inks by uh, Steve Ditko and the letters by Art Simic. That's quite the team on this issue. Anyway, so as I was saying, Reed, uh, you know, kind of blows himself up in an experiment, which isn't really anything new. Um, even at this point, <laughs> uh, even this early. And so obviously the other three are rather frightened about the situation and they head in to uh, save him. Now, <clears throat> of course, they don't realize, now this is what I think is absolutely hilarious. And they've mentioned this a bunch of times in a bunch of early issues that Mr. Fantastic has this <laughs> his bestest coated suit <laughs> that he puts on that allows him to be safe in these ex experiments and he also gets uh, Johnny out of the way uh, torch there uh, because the fumes are, could blow him up. Anyway, they are all safe now but then they start to realize here that whatever experiment he was doing, he sure there's a lot of power. Now, what he was actually doing was uh, studying a piece of uh, a uh, meteor. Now, what he's what's really interesting about this book, and why I, one of the reasons why I, I love it so much, is that um, there's an actual space race going on at this time between uh, the Soviet Union and obviously America, and. Um, this is right in the heat of it. This, so like everyone was, the talk is who's gonna get to the moon first, right? Now this is obviously several years before they got to the moon, um, but uh, the, the Apollo program is obviously well underway at this time. And um, what Mr. Fantastic has done is he has discovered a propulsion source that he has found in uh, an old meteor site in uh, Arizona, I think is what he said it was, which is actually there. And um, that he was taking it off, uh, you know, using the example that was used by the uh, Soviets in this story, where he is going to, uh, the, where they had a meteor drop, you know, out in the forest and, and level a whole bunch of Siberia that happened too that's real um, and so you know he's uh, telling them all about his uh, idea now he can make the rocket that he's been working on get to and land on the moon 
and he's just gonna go do it by himself. Of course, you can see here the thing isn't too pleased about the situation, twists them all up and <laughs> puts him in a little tube until Reed says, yeah, sure, everyone can come along with me. <laughs> now, here we go. On the other side of the uh, globe, we have uh, a very ominous looking figure here. Not, uh, you know, doesn't look like a very nice guy, does he? And so here we have, you know, you know, you can tell he's not a nice guy. His name is Ivan Kragoff, and uh, he's on his way to the moon already. Well, not yet. He has the same idea as the FF, but he's going to go uh, to the moon, And but he's going with, uh, is it a baboon, an ape, and an orangutan. And uh, he has... In sleep, this is the FF, you can see they're about getting ready to take off. So is Kragov, and they both kind of, we don't know if they're blasting off at exactly the same time, or very close, something along those lines. And, um, yeah. So, the thing that's interesting about what Kragov is doing is he has made this sort of transparent ceramic plastic uh, uh, rocket. So what his plan is, is to, unlike the Fantastic Four who got bombarded by cosmic rays and then got out of there and were left with powers, he wants to be completely unprotected from the cosmic rays, expose himself and his uh, apes even more, and then be more powerful than the FF. I love the way they did this stuff with the old FF uh, stories. Just a wonderful, classic Jack Kirby drawing there. Just awesome. And so they're obviously on their way to the moon, and uh, they spot another rocket. And they, I love how it uh, Reed says, it has a communist insignia, but they have announced no space shots. I don't understand. And I just thought that that was kind of funny. Um, so... Torch uh, has wants to go check things out because, uh, you know, Reed has made this uh, chemical tuxedo for him that allows him to, you know, his suit allows him to go out into space and has oxygen in it so he can maintain his fire and heat and not freeze and die. Um, if you could go into space just outside. Anyway, whatever not all that important um so he has you can see kragov has his uh guys in there torchy is uh, lying around uh just checking out what's going on one of the primates sees him and gets upset and this is when he realizes kragov that uh his experiment has worked because this ape has, has a hundredfold the strength of a normal ape would uh, the baboon is able to be a shapeshifter. And here's my favorite one. Um, the uh, guy here, which is this, is the, is this the, no, what did I say? This is the orangutan, sorry. He has become magnetized. He has magnetic powers. I wonder where that's going to go. Like I said, this issue is from April of 1963. Um, I'm don't remember when X-Men number one exactly like the month that it came out. I think it was like September 1963 uh, would be the first appearance of Magneto. So I would have to say that, you know, that might be where the inspiration for Magneto might have come from. I don't know. Same, same writer, same, uh, you know, artist. So you never know. Anyway back to our story so they're going to torch comes back lets them know what he saw um they're gonna go land on the moon now in the the blue section of the moon which is where they wanted to go and as they're lowering their their rocket down they start to notice the remnants of an old uh, society or civilization civilization on the moon and uh so they get down there want to check out the the scenario but all of a sudden they kind of start experiencing some weirdness so before pan they see this city 
Johnny can obviously fly. Um, Reed stretches and takes Sue with him, leaving uh, uh, Ben alone. And then so he go, gets mad and he goes to kick a rock, and it's the shape-shifting baboon. The thing gets attacked by all three of them, and then uh, Kragoff comes out, and then we learn that he is can now turn himself invisible or turn himself into a ghost and or have his properties not be there and he can get un, what does he say here through mental control i will i can make any part of my body become solid instantly solid enough to grasp this club for instance so they start going at it with the thing until suddenly enough Put down that weapon, the Watcher commands you. And we, of course, get to see for the first time ever the Watcher. Now, this Watcher here at this point in time, there is no name. It is just the Watcher, and that is perfectly fine with me. And he starts to, you know, I, at this point, he wants us to be a one-on-one -on -one battle between... Um, Kragov and the thing because he sees that the thing's outnumbered uh, but then you know like I said he starts like, well, the watcher explains who he is explains where they his planet is like a big giant computer you know he they've seen civilizations rise and fall blah 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 and anyway he says you two fight it out and then he disappears after having put uh, the primates in bubbles so that they can't join that fight at any rate, uh, <laughs> this thing is funny. Um, Reed stretches and grabs onto the thing and pulls him into the city where the rest of them are. And they start to talk, tell him about like what they're seeing there. He starts to tell them about uh, the um, Kragov and the apes. And then the Watcher appears again. He twists them up in a cyclone, brings everybody from both sides inside to the the city and uh lets them know that they are gonna now have an even fair four on four fight to decide who is going to you know i guess claim rights to be the first humans on the moon although they now know that they weren't the first people on the moon uh, but that's okay and um uh one of the things that uh is interesting is going to be obviously Kragov, like we saw they exposed him and uh, the primates to more um, cosmic rays than the Fantastic Four had so they're uh, gonna be no uh, they might have more power we'll find out and so here I just want to read this little part here he says that's a real noble thought uh, after you know actually that part doesn't matter sorry uh, Ben said, you know, Kragov's not going to have it. Uh, he's not going to buy it. Ain't going to buy it. Not when he thinks uh, him and those apes are strong enough to lick us and claim the moon for the commies. <laughs> uh, ben, nobody is strong enough to defeat uh, a free people. Don't ever forget that. Um, that horrible man, those deadly beasts, they might be watching us at this very moment waiting to strike, says Sue. And so then, of course, it happens. Uh, I love how this guy magically, Kragov, finds like a freezing gun to, to shoot and freeze Johnny. And he's got a hold of Sue, and uh, that's never good. Takes Sue sort of hostage, and the, the others are very busy dealing with, you know, the other apes as he abducts uh, Sue there. And then, you know, not not the best plan uh, for the FF, but I think we'll have to see what happens. Anyway, they do manage to, uh, you know, get... Johnny does manage to, sorry, get himself out of the uh, uh, ice thing. But, uh, you know, Reed's been beat up a little bit, but he's okay. Now, of course, Reed says that, you know, we need to realize here that they might be stronger than us, but um, we, what they have is 
they have three working human brains. The Kragoff is only their one brain uh, that's human. Um, and uh, of course, he is calling himself the Red Ghost, uh, which is, you know, kind of funny. The communist, the Reds, yeah, okay. And uh, so even though he's not like, he sh I, that's my opinion. I think he should just be dressed in red, but whatever. <laughs> he should have like a hammer and sickle like uh, on him or somewhere. I think that would just be more interesting. Anyway, I'm babbling a lot here. This is what happens when you smoke too much before you do a video. Yeah. Anyway, it happens. So, you know, they're, they're fighting each other here. Uh, like I said, Sue is uh, trapped in there. They've got her prisoner. The Red Ghost uh, comes through to draw in uh, the others. Where uh, So uh, the Thing and Johnny come in there trying to try to burn through this rock to get at to um, Kragoff. But uh, Sue, of course, on the other side says that you know, she can also make herself invisible and manipulate force fields. She frees herself, notices what's going on, goes out there and lets them know, goes in and first because she is obviously invisible and, you know, messes shit up for uh, Kragov. Now, um, of course, Kragov's not a not the nicest guy as he's saying here once I learn the watcher's secrets the universe itself will be mine and there is none to stop me for a man who cannot be touched cannot be stopped yeah the watcher's not gonna like that very much and so though he decides to teach him a lesson he's like oh listen buddy don't think you realize who you're talking to here but if you want I can put you in an internal limbo I can send you back in time a million years I can send you to the future at the end of the universe. I can pretty much mess with you however I see fit. So you just play by my rules. Now, in that magical time that this has taken place, uh, Reed has put together a gizmo that uh, works. It's a paralysis ray. Cool. So, you know, they... They paralyze uh, Kragov, and um, and that that's not the you know not quite the end because we know that there's still the primates out there too. But Watcher comes down and says that uh, you know you have triumphed. He's talking to the FF, of course, um, and he says that his mission is at, at an end too. Now that that. Uh, the Earth peoples have uh, reached the moon. They should. Um, uh, he's gonna back off further to be at a further place where he can watch and do his thing, because that's what watchers do. Um, so you know, Kragov still thinks that you know he can mind control the apes, but not while he's paralyzed. And they, you know, they're not gonna listen to him anymore. And so we pretty much can figure out that Kragov ain't coming back to Earth. And so now the FF can take off and come back to and head home and uh, let the government know that they have uh, been the first to released from Earth to have a successful uh, trip to the moon. Love this book. One thing I wanted to point out, or just see here, is that I usually don't even like really talk about or even look at this stuff, but special announcements section said, uh, once again, we want to thank hundreds of loyal fans whose interesting letters can't be printed due to the lack of space. Please be rest assured that either Stan or Jack or both read each and every one personally and are tremendously grateful for your interest and support. Uh, final result of our add new characters poll. The count uh, is 3 to 1 against adding any new members to the FF, but most readers would like to see frequent guest appearances for other uh, superheroes, and they say will do. So that's just, I really thought that that was really cool, really interesting kind of shows you what they were doing back then that uh, 
you know, they like t to listen to the fans, and uh, it's not necessarily something that happens anymore. And so, this has been Fantastic Friday. Number five, thank you for joining me here on the Sun of the Morning Comics channel. Sorry about my ridiculousness in this video. Like I said, I should not smoke so much before I record a video. But hey, I live in Canada. It's legal. What can I say? I, I am who I am. Have a good one. <laughs>